Anyone who's toiled away on one practically 24-7 job for 70 years without complaint surely deserves a hearty pat on the back. But in the lead up to her platinum jubilee, what Queen Elizabeth doesn't deserve is what she's getting. And that's members of her own family stealing her limelight. Her grandson Harry and his wife Meghan can't seem to stop sharing with the world how disgruntled they are. While her son, Andrew, well, the less said about him, the better. It guarantees the celebration of the Queen's milestone will be unforgettable, but not necessarily for the right reasons. London is getting some spit and polish. A spruce up for a very special occasion. In a little over two weeks' time, official celebrations marking Queen Elizabeth's 70 years on the throne begin. It should be a party like no other. After all, no other monarch has achieved such longevity in the top job. But behind palace walls, the House of Windsor is in turmoil. You have on the one hand what should be a lead up to a Queen's Platinum Jubilee where the family is absolutely united, but at the same time you've got these boiling dramas sort of stage right that could blow up at any moment and has left them in a kind of fragile place. No one knows the drama and dysfunction of the royal family better than Tina Brown. As the former editor of Tatler, Vanity Fair and the New Yorker magazines, as well as the author of the acclaimed Diana Chronicles, the palace has been her beat for more than 40 years. She's lunched with Diana, had dinners with Charles and curtsied for the Queen. She's also now written a new book, The Palace Papers. It doesn't hold back in its critique of the modern royals. To penetrate the royal code of silence is extremely difficult. I don't have to tell you that. You say you interviewed about 120 people for this book. But what was the most toxic topic that you've ever tried to get information from behind the palace walls within the House of Windsor? The Harry Meghan thing is, is very raw. And uh, although some want to speak about it, if reluctantly, there are others that just feel the topic is so destructive and explosive that they really don't want to talk about it. And they're still worried because it's still in play, largely. They're still worried because it's become a very volatile situation. Um, what they have seen is that Harry has not just had his say once. He's going to keep having his say. I have no regrets. It's, it's incredibly sad, but I have no regrets at all because now I'm in, the, in a place where I feel as though I should have been four years ago. There's a fear about trust. There's a lot of mistrust right now in the royal family. A lack of trust is not the ideal starting point for a friendly family reunion, and it's clearly fueling tensions. Please welcome my incredible husband, Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex. While the Duke and Duchess of Sussex will return to London for the Jubilee celebrations... God, I've missed you all. ..they've been banned from joining the Queen on the balcony at Buckingham Palace. See the Duchess of Sussex there again uh, on the balcony. It's a brutal snub for Harry and Meghan, who these days seem almost addicted to centre stage. What is the current state of the relationship between William and Harry, Tina? Are they talking a little bit, a lot? Are they still arguing? Do they talk at all? There's very little communication between Harry and William right now, uh, very little. Unfortunately, the wounds of the Oprah interview were, were deep. And then, of course, you know, Harry's kept it up since. You know, he keeps on, you know, throwing bombs, actually. I mean, his announcement that he's going to do his own truth-telling memoir really has rattled the family tremendously because it's sort of hanging over them now. They don't know what he's going to say. And they're very nervous about what it says. And they have every reason to be nervous because over the last couple of years, Harry has shown what an angry young man he is. I myself was trapped as well. I didn't see she a way out. She felt trapped? You were trapped? Yeah, I didn't see a way out. Trapped within the system, like the rest of my family are. 
my father and my brother, they are trapped. <laughs> they don't get to leave. About the only royal Harry seems to have time for these days is the Queen. Oh, really? <sighs> Please. Boom. Well, you came home to the UK, you saw your grandmother. How was that? It was great. It was really nice to see her. Be able to see her in some element of privacy was, was, was nice. How did it feel being back? It was just so nice to see her. You know, she's on, she's on great form. We always, she's always got a great sense of humor uh, with me, and I'm just making sure that she's, you know, protected and got the, the right people around. Well, you, you well that it. actually went over like a lead balloon uh, with his family because, I mean, they feel that they've been there for her. They are the people with her, and he wasn't <laughs> for the last two years. He's been in Montecito. He's a strange mix, isn't he? On the one hand, he has this pathological hatred of the press. On the other hand, he's quite happy to use them to seal the entertainment deals, to do the headline interviews, to promote his book. Well, it's certainly a paradox that the man who kept saying that all he wanted was privacy now can't seem to stop talking. And I think that that is baffling to his family. In fact, one of the things I heard uh, constantly, you know, from within the royal family uh, uh, people, they said, like, we don't recognise Harry. We don't understand, you know, why he's doing this. Just don't understand it. And it is kind of baffling. It's almost as if suddenly liberated from, you know, all the constraints that he's been in. He just simply wants to just blabber everything that's on his mind. It's, uh, I think, very destructive. Tina Brown's sources tell her the fear in the palace is that there's a lot of his mother in Prince Harry and that his trip home will be used as an opportunity to continue his campaign of chaos. In some ways, I mean, Harry's taken up the legacy of Diana, it seems, to kind of lob these grenades at unexpected moments that has everybody completely off, off form. Yeah, I have no doubt that my mum would be incredibly proud of me. I'm living the life that she wanted to live for herself. It's a tragedy, I think, that he's gone so off about his family. His emotions rule Harry's head. There's no doubt about it. And there's a deep resentment in Harry for everything that he's been through in the past. And unfortunately, in recent years, it's it's really seems to have become then inner directed, you know, towards his his family, particularly his father, which is actually very sad, I think, for Charles, who I think did try to do his best, you know, in his in his own way as a, as a single parent. It's worth sparing a thought for Prince Charles, troubled and scandal ridden for much of his own life but now consumed with never-ending family dramas, trying to understand the wants of his renegade son, providing support for his increasingly frail mother, and managing the ongoing embarrassment of his brother, who refuses to butt out of royal life. Prince Andrew obviously didn't get the email that he was supposed to stay on the sidelines. What is that? Is that complete arrogance or is it stupidity? Stupidity. Um, Andrew has always been a dim bulb and something of an oaf, let's face it. It's, it's going to be a problem. Andrew has been cancelled, essentially. I mean, you couldn't be more cancelled than Andrew, right? He's been told, you're done. But where do you stash a, a, a 61-year-old healthy man who has no desire to be stashed? anywhere and who's going to keep trying to push himself out onto the public stage. He's not going quietly. I mean, in, in previous centuries, Andrew would have been sort of banished to the borders, you know, and, 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 and locked up in some castle keep. But, you know, you can't do that in the 21st century. Andrew lives like a stone's throw from mummy, you know, in Windsor Great Park. And he's going to be out there at every turn. Despite being his mother's favourite child, Prince Andrew has also been banished from the Buckingham balcony. But as the world saw last month at Prince Philip's memorial, he rarely does what he's told. And I think nobody was happy to see uh, him at her side at that service. But I'm also told that he pushed his way in, that in fact he wasn't supposed to be walking down the aisle with her. She was supposed to be handed off at that point to the dean, and he was supposed to walk her there. But, you know, when a queen's son, you know, sort of elbows his way into the shot, um, no one's going to have a scene in the middle of a memorial service, so that's what happened. And it was a source of great anxiety and, and sorrow 
to the family. And I think, I think to everyone actually, because it was not, as they say, a good look. It's dangerous actually, it's not a good situation. And that's not even the half of it. The latest word from inside the palace is that Prince Andrew's sense of entitlement is out of control. Surely he can't really believe that his image can be resurrected after being best mates with the world's richest pedophile. When it comes to Prince Andrew's privileged life of embarrassing excess, we might think we've heard all the grubby details. But in her new book, The Palace Papers, Tina Brown reveals even more surprises. You relate a story told by an American media executive of Andrew calling Fergie a big fat cow. Oh, God. In front of her. Is, is that accurate? Is, is he really that mean? Yes. I think that Andrew, I think that he's a boorish man. I think he's a very boorish man. Is he really the Queen's favourite son? The Queen has a very, very soft spot for Andrew. She has found his conduct, I, I, I'm sure, you know, distressing. Um, but, you know, a mother is a mother, and you cannot tell a mother what to feel about her children, you know. And apparently, no one has yet been able to convince Andrew that a friendship with Jeffrey Epstein has consequences. Surely he can't really believe that his image can be resurrected after being best mates with the world's richest pedophile. Andrew fully expects to be rehabilitated. He ex yes, he, he's not even accepted that he's going to uh, have to have a quiet few years. Andrew believes strongly that he can get back. And I'm told that this is something that he's obsessed with, that uh, he believes that this is going to happen that, you know, over due time, he will get back into the mix. And of course, his mother right now um, is the best route as he sees it, because uh, the Queen's stature is such that no one is going to say to her, you cannot see your son. And even though she has no desire uh, now to have him, uh, uh, you know, seen with her on balconies and understands that and knows and wishes for him to not be part of that, he can keep pushing his face in. When it comes to causing disruption, it's almost as if Andrew has been taking lessons from Harry and Meghan. For the forthcoming celebration of the Queen's 70 years on the throne, the Sussexes find themselves in an unlikely position. They're not the stars of the show. Sitting on the sidelines is not something they're used to, and that's got the palace worried. You write about the 2018 Tour of Australia by Harry and Meghan, sort of a seminal moment for them when Meghan thought that the royal family needed her celebrity more than she needed them. That was something that, that puzzled um, the royal sort of household tremendously because their Tour of Australia was a wild success more successful than Kate and Williams in terms of the crowds and the adulation. She, she wanted to be able to uh, talk more about the causes that she cared about it as her, as opposed to being a representational figure of the monarchy. There was a sense of real disappointment when she came home, that somehow she was a star beyond you know, anything one's seen, except for Diana, really, on this tour. I guess it, it was the star power, essentially, that she felt now was bigger than what she was allowed to do in the monarchy. What she does now, with all her freedom, is anyone's guess. But Tina has discovered there's something Meghan can't be accused of causing, Mexit. One of the things that surprised me, uh, very did very much surprise me, was that one of his uh, uh, close people at the palace said to me, you know, we always thought that Harry would leave. We always thought at some point Harry would leave because he was so unhappy in the constraints of, uh, uh, you know, the system. In Meghan, he met somebody who was dynamic enough and sort of um, self-directed enough to say, we don't need this anymore. We can, we can be happier than we are now. We don't need to do it. You're implying Harry drove Mexit more than Meghan did, at least in the early stages. 
I think they were co-drivers. I think they were co-pilots on this. I think that Meghan has been somewhat unfairly targeted as the one who sort of took him away from his family. I actually think that, that Harry wanted out. For the family, they very much have this mentality of this is just how it is. This is how it's meant to be. You can't change it. But for all her criticism of Prince Harry's erratic behaviour, Tina hopes his exile isn't forever. He does have this habit of, of rattling them, but at the same time, mm. there is a desire to have Harry back, I believe, deep down. I think that, I think they need him, actually. Um, I think at this moment, um, to have Harry on the balcony would be an, a, a positive thing. Even after all this? Even after all that he's said? Even after what he's said, this is still a family. And Harry has a great deal to offer. That's kind of what the family feel about Harry, is that he is uh, a handful. But at the same time, he also has a lot of charisma and a big emotional connection with people. You've spent a great deal of your professional life writing about the royal family and publishing various revelations over the past 20 odd years. What fascinates you about the royal family? Why have you spent so much time looking at the way they operate? My fascination with the family is that this is a family. They may be living in castles, they may, be, uh, they may wear a crown, but the fact is, they're, they're like anybody's family. There are, you know, the, 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 the ones who, who work out, the, the, the miscreants, the prodigal sons, the, 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 you know, the, the, the ones who fall in love with the wrong people. I mean, this is a family. And as such, that tension between those two things, you know, the power of their position and the humanity of who they are, it's, it's a very uh, compelling story. It's a family drama that this remarkable, uh, powerful, potent institution of monarchy rests upon the frail shoulders of human beings who are like any other family. How would you describe the state of the monarchy at the moment? Fragile. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.